I had my first baby shortly after I turned 30. To prepare, I read every single page of what to expect when you're expecting, more than once. I followed the parenting advice of the times. I breastfed my baby, I pumped when I was at work, I started solid food on time, and I moved my daughter through all the stages of food introduction. I was responsive to her. I fed her when she was hungry, and I stopped when she was full. You could say I was very focused on getting this part of parenthood right. When my daughter was 12 months old, my pediatrician told me her weight was low. She was clinically almost underweight. At the time, I had been privately struggling with how difficult it had become to feed her. She didn't want to come to the high chair, and when she was there, she only took a couple bites, pushed the food off the tray, and said, all done. I struggled, and I had two instincts. My first instinct when I heard the news was to feed her whatever I could get her to eat and make sure she ate it all. My second instinct was totally opposite. It was to stay the course, not push her to have more food, not force her to finish her meals. And I struggled with the decision. I wrestled with the right approach. Ultimately, I went with my second instinct. I stayed the course. I didn't push her to eat more food, and I certainly didn't force her to finish her meals. In fact, I worked really hard to make sure food wasn't an issue. At her 18-month checkup, I learned she was anemic and still not gaining enough weight. You could say this kind of rocked me to the core. Not only had I failed my daughter, I had failed as a mother. And what was worse, I had failed at the one thing I was supposed to know inside and out. You see, I'm a pediatric dietitian. I'm a professional trained in the science of nutrition and feeding babies, toddlers, children, and teens. At the time, I'd been a professional for seven years, and I was taking care of some of the sickest kids on our planet. Nutrition and feeding, <laughs> that was my wheelhouse, my comfort zone. But what I knew in my bones as a pediatric nutritionist did not jive at all with what I was facing day in and day out with my own child. At work, I was an expert. At home, I was a stressed out, struggling parent. I didn't know if what I was doing was right or if I was making things worse. Humbling, yes. But what I didn't expect was that this experience would be a pivotal moment in my life as a mom and as a professional. What I learned was that feeding kids is not easy. It takes a lot of work. That pivotal moment, it influenced my work as I moved forward. It changed, it radically changed the way I work and the way I see childhood nutrition today. I had a powerful revelation. If feeding my own child was so challenging, humbling, and causing me to swim in pools of self-doubt, what was this experience like for other parents? Parents who didn't have the education, training, and experience that I did. Our nation has many child health problems, too many for me to list here tonight, but I want to give you a little snapshot. Obesity affects one in three children. 8% of our babies are overweight. 
Eating disorders are on the rise in children under 12 and in boys. One out of 13 kids will be diagnosed with a food allergy. Picky eating, it is lasting longer. And we're seeing more and more cases of extreme picky eating. Iron deficiency anemia, it's still a significant concern in our youngest children. You may hear these child health problems and think, these things are caused by food. Fix the food and we will certainly fix the child. <laughs> I wish it were that easy. The problem isn't food. The real problem is that parents don't know how to nourish, nourish and nurture the health of their children. There are three main areas of nutrition education that are missing for parents. Addressing these gaps can be a real game changer for our nation's kids. The first area is food education. As a pediatric nutritionist, I get questions about food all the time. What food can I give my child to make him healthier? What's the best diet for my child? Which brand of yogurt, cereal, granola is the best? I hate to break the bubble, but there is no magic food, best diet, or special plan. Chia seeds, Greek yogurt, broccoli will not cure obesity, reverse picky eating, or even make a child a healthy eater. This idea of fixing our child health problems with food alone sends parents on the wrong path looking for a quick fix. Kale-infused smoothies, cauliflower mashed potatoes, carrot spiked spaghetti sauce. Parents think, if I could just get my child to eat healthy food, everything will be okay. And those child health problems, <laughs> they won't happen to us. Almost every parent I meet needs food education. They need to understand the balance of food the portion sizes for children, and the nutrients their growing kids need. And they need to know this early because it helps them nourish their children well. Yes, food education is part of the recipe for a healthier child, but it's not the whole enchilada. The second area is feeding education. Did you know that how a child is fed is just as important as what they eat. Let me repeat that. How a child is fed is just as important as what they eat. That interaction between the parent and child during the process of feeding can be a powerful predictor of how well a child will eat. From the foods that they choose and their ability to regulate their eating to their developing relationship with food. We have a body of research that tells us feeding is powerful. So let me explain. Will was a picky eater. He was very underweight. In fact, he was not growing well at all. His parents did everything they could do to get him to eat. They begged him. They bribed him. They even tried to punish him. Nothing worked. In fact, Will got worse. Pressuring a child to eat is largely ineffective. In some kids, like Will, it shuts down their appetite, leading to less eating, more pickiness, and even a dislike for the foods parents are trying to get their kids to eat. Other children, they might comply, they might eat more, even though their be bellies tell them, I'm full. You see, some children will do whatever their parents ask them to do, even eat more food when they're not hungry. What if there's an overweight child or a big eater or a child who just loves food? In that scenario, a family, a mom or a dad might get nervous, might worry about their children's weight or their health or their eating habits. 
And in that worry, they may try to limit or restrict food access and even tightly control their child's eating. This happened to Rachel. Her mom was worried about her weight, and so she did what she thought was the best thing to do. And she took away sweets and treats and all the junky foods, and she got rid of them out of the house in the hopes that this would prevent Rachel from gaining any more weight. But this didn't work out very well for Rachel. She started to sneak food. And when she was at class parties and friends' houses, when those foods were around, she overate them, sometimes to the point of making herself sick. And you know what? She gained more weight. When parents restrict or tightly limit or even control their children's eating, it can make children preoccupied with food, seek it out, and even overindulge when it's available. Have any of you ever seen a parent reward a child for good behavior with a treat? Have you ever seen a parent offer dessert for a bite of broccoli? When parents use sweets and treats to reward their children for eating, children actually learn to like those foods more. And this can shift their food preferences and tip their eating to an unhealthy place. All these feeding strategies that I've just described, bribing, pressuring, restriction, even though they're well-intentioned, they don't work very well with children. In fact, they can backfire. When parents don't understand the power of feeding, or they don't have effective feeding strategies, they can actually do more harm to their child's developing relationship with food, encourage poor eating habits, and even contribute to their child's future health in a bad way. The third area of education is understanding child development and a child's temperament. For example, when my daughter was a toddler, her favorite word was no. The favorite thing she liked to say, I do it my big self. Toddlers want to separate from their parents and they want to be more independent. This is a hallmark of toddler development. My daughter was also high strung and a little bit stubborn. We don't know really where that came from. Maybe her DNA. Understanding a child's cognitive, social, and emotional development is golden. It is like the magic eight ball that tells us what could happen in the future. Even more, this trifecta of food, feeding, and child development I've just described is the anchor, the blueprint of exactly what parents need to know in order to raise a healthy child. So how do we do this? We've made a dangerous and costly mistake in our country. We have overlooked the foundation of any success plan, and that is education. I believe the answer to the rising incidences of child health problems and the costs associated with them is in a system-wide, institution-based, nutrition education program for parents. We value education in almost every other realm. We are patient and persistent with teaching our children how to read. We invest time and money in teaching our teenagers how to safely drive a car. We fund educational opportunities so our kids can go off to college or take that next step into adulthood. We have plans policies and guidelines for nearly everything you can imagine, except for the job of nourishing a child. Like many parents, I took a Lamaze class when I was pregnant with my first baby. My husband John and I spent six or seven weeks in a two-hour class learning how to breathe, relax, and for me, how to push that baby out into the world. 
14 hours spent on learning how to birth a baby. My baby came in 15 hours. We give this in-depth training and education to expectant parents so they know how to birth a baby, an event that takes, on average, less than 14 hours. Yet we give little guidance, education, or support to the job of nourishing a child, a job that will last 18 years. If we want healthier kids in our country, we need a better prescription for raising them. I believe we can do it with a systematic, institution-based nutrition education program that targets the parent. Can you imagine the difference if every birthing hospital offered nutrition education to expectant parents so that they knew exactly what to do for the first year of life? Can you imagine the difference if every pediatrician office offered guidance for what to expect at each stage of childhood and offered courses and a professional in the office to help parents navigate nutrition and the problems that can come up. Can you imagine the difference if parents knew and were knowledgeable about food, feeding, and childhood development? Can you imagine? I can. It's time for each and every one of us to up our game. Parents, healthcare providers, institutions, government-funded programs, corporations, organizations, insurance companies. When we collectively prioritize the nutrition education parents need to nourish and nurture their children, we will see a healthier nation of children. Thank you.